that's our theme for the next several weeks as we push toward Easter is behold our king. I want to take a chance. If you have a child who would like to go to children's church right now, they can follow Miss Kimberly over here to my right and join them. Um, Scott, you can't go. Sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I thought you was getting up to go, Scott. I'm my bad. Um, <clears throat> I know we say there's not an age limit, but there is a little bit, okay? Uh, the, today, uh, we're thankful. John chapter 10 is where we're going to be. Uh, like I said, you can follow them right there, and uh, they'll go that way and, and uh, have a, a good time and a message on their level. And we're thankful for all of our workers that work so diligently <clears throat> with our children. But today, we're in, in the Gospel of John chapter 10. As I said, looking at... Uh, over the next few weeks as we lead up to Easter, uh, just beholding or, or, or just acknowledging, recognizing our king, recognizing, you know, the Bible talks about that we should acknowledge God and all his benefits. You know, sometimes we don't like to talk about that. We, we feel like there's, maybe it's, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, not good or faux pas, we might call it, to, to talk about the benefits of serving God. But I want to tell you what, man, there are a ton of benefits to serving God. Uh, just because of who he is and what he does on our behalf. Now, there's some, there's some difficulty, too, and not everything in life is easy, and uh, we understand that, and we know that there are struggles and trials that we all go through in life, and, and that's part of it. And that's even more the reason why we need a relationship with the Lord, more why we need him with us and on our, and, and, and on our side and on our behalf and fighting for us and, 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 and not against us. You know, that we talked about a couple of weeks ago in Hebrews about it being a fearful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And, and, and so many times we take that, that verse gets taken out of context. But basically what it means is, is don't, don't turn your back on him. Uh, you, we can, you have two choices. You can place yourself into his hand in salvation or you can fall into, it in, in, into his wrath because we, we choose to do our own thing and go our own way. Those are really the two choices that we have. But today, I want to talk about, I titled this message, The Door, but really and truthfully, it probably should be more, it would be a better title would be The Good Shepherd, which is really the, the passage we're talking about is a shepherd, another shepherd uh, place where, where Jesus refers to himself as the good shepherd and what that means. And I know when we think about shepherd, that kind of gets into that gray area, doesn't it? Because I don't know about you, I, I'm not very familiar with shepherds. I haven't had too many sheep in my life uh, that I've known about or or taken care of and don't know a lot about sheep. So what I learn about them, I have to learn from someone else or have to learn uh, just by, by, by studying and reading about what it's all about. But I want to tell you today, as we think about our world, as we think about the time in which we live and, and what's happening in our world, and, 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 and no matter where you're at or on, on, the, on your walk with the Lord, whether you have known the Lord your whole life or whether you've only known him for a short time, uh, we look around and we see chaos. We see questions. I, I don't know about you, but we, a lot of times more questions than we have answers. And, and that's why it's so important that we realize who God is and what he's doing and what he is, is there to provide on our behalf. And, and, and this is a great passage, and we're going to be looking through the Gospel of John over these next two or three weeks at different aspects of, of what it is that God is for us. And today we're looking at he is that he is that door, but he's also that shepherd all at the same time, as we see in this passage of Scripture. So I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand with me in the honor of, of, of reading God's Word very quickly, and then we'll uh, walk through this a, a few minutes together. The Bible says in, in verse 1 of John 10, it says, Truly, 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 truly just means, hey, listen up. Uh, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what these things were, which he said to them. So Jesus said to them again, listen up, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the shepherd, the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, 
he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who is not the owner of the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and is not concerned about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my own, and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I'm going to skip down to verse 17. Verse 17 says, For this reason, the Father loves me. And I, I say a better translation of that is because of my love, because of the Father's love for me, because of my love for the Father, I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Teach us today, Lord, and uh, help us to understand who you are as our great and good shepherd. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. We know the first thing we have to understand is the whole shepherding sheep thing. Um, like I say, I don't know about you. Uh, some of you may be from different areas of the world where you have experienced and seen shepherds and sheep. But the only experience I've ever had really ever seeing shepherds and sheep is um, one time or a couple of times when I've traveled to Romania for our par partner church, sister church over there, I've seen it off at a distance and I've seen them out there, but I never really sat and watched them. I've read a lot about it a couple of years ago. We had a young man uh, here who uh, is a practicing shepherd and, and does a lot of that. He shared some of the insights of what that means. But in reading about shepherd, one thing I've said before, you know, we ought to be in, in our society today, in American culture, if the Bible was written now, everyone would be offended um, because sheep are just dumb animals. And, you know, in the church, in the, the church and the people, Christians are referred to as sheep over and over again in the Scripture. So, I mean, we should be very, very offended by that. But the reality is we know ourselves, right? We know who we are, and we know that when it comes to following Christ many times, uh, we are kind of slack, aren't we? We are kind of slow and, and, and slow to catch on. We, we, we kind of we think we've got it figured out, and then all of a sudden something changes. And, and, and so, so we think about that idea. Sheep are a type of animal that needed constant direction. Left to themselves, they will get in trouble so fast and be put in harm's way, even, even killed by wild animals. I mean, the, the wolves and, and all those, the lions, the, they love sheep. I mean, it's like, you know, it's like going to a buffet. I mean, you know, they, they're just there. They can't protect themselves. They have no defense mechanism. So, you know, except for the shepherd, they really are, you know, easy prey. But that's why I think this illustration is Jesus gives this metaphor really in the first few verses, then he kind of ties in some real life idea, real life, real life ideology, but a lot of metaphor in here about sheep and shepherd, but it speaks directly to what he, it does for us because we are, if, if we're honest with ourselves, we all are like sheep, right? That, by that scripture, it says we all like sheep have gone astray. Uh, we all have, we, we all still do, don't we? We all have the tendency left to ourselves to wander not to God, but away from him. And that's why today it's so important as we look at this passage of Scripture, we realize what this shepherd who is the doorway to salvation, the doorway to life, is all about. And number one, what are the benefits that this good shepherd does for us and for his, for his sheep? Because that's really what we are. Number one, the good shepherd offers security. Now, to understand these verses, the very first verse says, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep or the, the, the sheep pen, but climbs up some other way, he is a thief and robber. Now, we got to get a picture of what a sheep pen is. Because, um, you know, I, I didn't know this and, and I was studying this, but a sheep pen in this day would have basically been a place of security. Uh, it was not a place for intruders, but a sheep fold would have likely been either circular or square, an enclosure, 
probably constructed of like a, a high stone fence or wall and perhaps topped with, with vines. So it was something that was fairly large, uh, but it was uh, encompassed about. The entrance, would have, the entrance to the sheep pen would have been the only break in the entire wall. So it's a solid wall, square or circular, except for one small area where the sheep could go in that would be considered the doorway. <clears throat> and once the um, sheep were all safely inside at night, the watchman or the guard or even possibly the shepherd or a servant of the shepherd uh, would lie down across the opening and serve both as the protector for the sheep and as a gate to the sheep pen. You see, unless an intruder, unless an intruder was willing to confront the watchman or the shepherd, he couldn't come in. The only other way would have been to climb the wall, which would have been very difficult to do in that day. So we see the imagery here, the security of God. When we, when we place our faith in him, when, when, when Christ brings us into salvation, when we give our life to him, he brings us into his fold. He brings us into his sheep pen. And, and, and so in, in, as we'll see in just a moment, the doorway is blocked. The doorway is blocked, one, so the sheep can't wander off, but most importantly, it's blocked so that intruders and thieves and robbers and um, prowlers and everything else can't get in to get to the sheep. This is what God does for us. Is we, when God brings us into his fold, he is the one who protects us. He's the one that gives us security. As we think about this idea, we think about three things that we see in these first few verses about how God provides us security. First of all, it's because the shepherd knows his sheep. We're told over and over again in this passage of Scripture that he enters and he knows his sheep. They hear his voice and they know him. But not only that, he knows who they are. You know, I, I, if I went in, and this has been a, a, a phenomenon I've read about, if I went in and looked at a, just a pen full of sheep, it's a pen full of sheep, right? I mean, that's pretty much what it is. But in, in this day, what you don't know is these sheep pens were obviously rather in, obtrusive to kind of build, kind of difficult to build. So what you would have is you'd have multiple shepherds to build this larger pen and multiple flocks would be in this one pen. So it was extraordinarily important because several flocks being in one pen, that recognition of the shepherd was just imperative. Um, only personal identification with a shepherd could make those sheep feel safe. But when the shepherd came in with all these sheep mingled and, and mangled in there together, how in the world do you know the difference? Well, the Bible tells us that the shepherd, and if you talk to shepherds, the shepherds know their sheep. Now, I'm like you. Sheep all look alike to me. I mean, unless they're a different color, I'm not telling the difference. But the shepherd knows his sheep, just like the shepherd Christ knows his people. He knows us, and not only that, he uh, th that's why it's so important. That's why this idea of protection, this idea of security is such a big thing because those sheep know that their shepherd is there. They hear his voice. The Bible says also here that the shepherd calls his sheep. In verse 3, it says this. It says, to him, talking about the shepherd, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name. He calls his own sheep by name. He knows you. Do you realize that God knows you and I? I'll tell you, that's one of the most amazing things to me. I mean, as I look around and I see creation, I see the, the, just the greatness and the grandeur of God. You know, living in this area, you, you ride up, especially in the fall, and you see the leaves changing color. You see the mountains uh, in, in this area. And I know in other places, you, you just see the beauty of God's creation, and you think how great God is. And you think about what Scripture says, that the entire universe, and some nights when it's really dark outside, you get away from all the the lights of a town or a city and you can see all the stars and you realize that the Bible says that, that he holds all of the universes in the palm of his hand. We realize the grandeur of God, but, but then we realize the intimacy of God, that he knows us by name. The Bible says he knows the numbers of the hairs of our head. The Bible says he calls us by name, just like the shepherd. He doesn't just have a huge flock of sheep. He knows those individual sheep and he knows what's happening with them. He knows which ones are more prone to wander than others. He knows which ones need a, a, a gentle encouragement. He knows which ones 
just need a good swift kick in the rear end to, to get back in line. I mean, I'm one of those swift kick kind of guys. I, that, that's just more me. But he knows. He knows us by name. He knows what we need. He calls us. He calls out to us. Do you realize that every one of us in our life have a calling from the shepherd? Mine, yours may not, yours isn't like mine. Mine's not like yours. But we all have a calling to the shepherd. And, and, and really and truthfully, that call is a call out of the sheepfold. Look at verse uh, 4 through 6 says, Jesus says, when he puts forth his, all his own, when he, in other words, when he brings them out, he calls them out, he leads them out, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And then it goes on to say, a stranger they won't follow because they don't know a stranger's voice. But they follow him. Number one, Jesus calls us out. You know, we're not called to stay in the sheep pen. We're called to be in the world, but we're called to follow our shepherd. We're called to recognize his voice, to know when he's leading or when someone else is trying to break in and steal, when someone else is trying to lead us astray. We're to recognize the voice of God. How do we recognize that? Well, it starts right here. It starts by knowing the word of God, by internalizing the word of God and, and hearing his voice. You know, some people ask, does, does God still speak audibly? I think he speaks louder than that. I, you know, when I hear the voice of God, whether it's an impression in my heart or whether it's through the word that I read or, or through it's another, it's through another person who speaks into my life, God's speaking, he's calling us out and he's saying, come out of the sheep pen. You know, the sheep pen's safe, isn't it? I kind of relate the sheep pen to what we do when we come here to church. Oh, it's, it's, it's easy to come here and raise our hands and sing praises and, and do all that kind of stuff. It's easy to come here and and, you know, be safe and secure, and, and everybody around here is kind of like-minded like us. So, you know, it, it's easy to do that. But what about when we get called outside the pen? What about when we walk out of the doors on Sunday morning and, and we go back to work on Monday or we go back to our school or we go back to wherever we, we go on Monday morning? How, how, what do we do then? And, and what we understand is, is that, that Christ is leading. The shepherd is leading his sheep. He's leading you. He'll lead you where you need to go. He'll take you where you need to be. We understand by this passage that the shepherd does not drive his sheep. He led them. Christ has already gone the way before us. He's journeyed through all of life's wilderness, the thick, thorn-grown wilderness. He knows the dangers that are out there. He knows what lies ahead. And the good shepherd leads his sheep, according to Psalm 23, beside the quiet waters he leads us beside still waters but that or otherwise we might get swept away the flock might get swept away by the rushing current or maybe the sound wouldn't allow them to hear the enemy approaching but you know we don't always get led into green pastures and still waters do we we love to read that psalm 23 we've been studying on sunday nights and it's a great passage of scripture but we all realize that sometimes he leads us through the, ravine, the deep ravines of life, doesn't he? Those difficult moments, those times where we're just not sure what's going to happen, but we can always be reassured of one thing, that wherever God leads us, he's there with us. His presence is there. We can hear his voice. Some of you in this place, in my, even my, in my own life, we've went through some of those ravines. We've went through some of those dark places. And I want to tell you, it's, it's always great to know that in the midst of a dark place, in the midst of that valley that I'm walking through, that God is there with me. He is my security. He protects me in the pen, but he also protects me when he calls me out of the pen. He also walks with me wherever I go. He takes care of me. He looks after me. But the good shepherd also provides, offers shelter. Verses 7 through 13 go on to tell us about the shelter that God provides. And he, you know, in verse 6, it tells us that Jesus had spoke those first five verses that we read there in a, fig, it was a figure of speech or a parable. And he said they didn't understand. Uh, just like sheep, isn't it? Uh, you keep talking to them, you keep pushing them, and they just still don't get it. But here he says, so, so I'm going to speak a little more plainly to you. Jesus is talking about the door and the sheep get pinned and all this. And he said, so Jesus said to them again, verse 7, listen up, truly, truly, Listen to me. I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, this is more plain. 
Jesus is saying, if you want to get into the pen, if you want to be a part of the fold or part of the flock, guess what? It only comes through me. Now, this is a reflection. I see what Jesus will say again in John 14, 6, in just a, a, a short few chapters over, a little bit later in this letter, when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. And then he goes on down. As we get on down into verse chapter, in verses 10 and 11, he, he says, if he, I am the door, verse 9, first and foremost, if anyone enters through me, he will be saved, and he will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. About seven or eight different times, if you heard that earlier when I read the passage of Scripture, Jesus says the good shepherd lays down his life. He lays down his life. He lays down his life. Do we realize as we look into this Easter season, as we realize uh, we celebrate the resurrection of Christ, it was first and foremost that Jesus laid his life down. He willingly gave it up is what paid the price and the penalty for my sin and for your sin. You see, the shepherd guards the sheep. Verse 7 says, I am the door. I'm the guard. I didn't, I didn't entrust this to some servant. I didn't entrust this to somebody else. I'm the door. Any, so, so what does that mean? Anything that wants to get to me has to go through him. How much more secure can you be? How much more provision can he provide? How much more shelter could I desire? The Bible says that we are sheltered in the shadow. We desire to be sheltered in the shadow of his wing. The Lord guards us. He talks about those thieves and robbers that came before him. Can I tell you, there are thieves and robbers all across this land today. They're wanting to tell you there are, there's all kinds of ways to get to God. Oh, that God's the peak of the mountain. It doesn't matter what path you take to get there. I don't, if you take the the Islam path or you take the Hindu path or you take the Buddhist path or we get, there's, I don't know how, I mean, it could be thousands of paths. Whatever path you take, as long as you get to the mountain peak, we're all worshiping the same God anyway, right? Not according to my Bible, not according to Scripture. And what makes the difference is that verse I quoted a moment ago in John 14, 6, where it says that Jesus said, you know, you go talk to any other religion, you go talk to a you go talk to someone who, who follows the teachings of Islam or, or Hinduism or, or Buddhism, if, if they're honest, and you ask them, what about Jesus? They'll all say he's a good prophet, he's a great teacher. But you see, you can't be a great teacher. You can't be a good person. You can't be even a good prophet and make a statement like John 14, 6 and, and not be true. John 14, 6, I said, and I'll say it again, Jesus said, this isn't somebody else's words, this is Jesus himself saying, I am. You, know, you see here, I am the good shepherd, one of, of a multiple of the I am statements of scripture. But Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to God. Nobody gets salvation. Nobody gets eternal life. Nobody gets the benefit of the shepherd. Nobody gets the benefit of anything unless you come through the door. I am the door, Jesus said. Nobody comes to the Father. Nobody comes to God except through me. There is one, listen, there is one path up the mountain, (laughs) and it's through Jesus Christ. The Bible says that the, the, the road to destruction is broad and wide, and there's a lot of people going down that path. But the road to salvation is narrow. It's straight, it says. And The scary part of that is it says few there are that find it. You know why that path is is hard to find? Because it's a path of sacrifice. It's a path of self-denial. It's a path of walking the way Christ calls me to walk, not the way I want to walk. The shepherd guards that. He is the entry point. He also provides for them. It says that if you'll come in, you'll go in and out and find pasture. One of the most, one of the greatest things for a sheep is a green pasture. I, I, I had a, a, a dog we had for 16 years. He, he passed away recently. Um, but that, I used to, used to love watch, I love to watch a dog every once in a while. You ever watch a dog go out into in a, just a thick, plush, green yard? What do they do? I don't care if they've just had a bath. 
Or what are they going to do? They're just going to go out and they're just going to get it. And they're just going to waller around and scratch their back. And they're just going to flop and float. And, and, and I'm yelling and screaming and going and grab because I've just washed it. And now you're out there rolling in the grass and stinking again and everything else. That's what a dog does, right? Why? Because they love that green. A sheep loves the green pasture. Why? Because it provides food. It provides security and safety. Because out in a wide open pasture, you can see what's coming, right? You can see if attacks are happening. Where they don't like to be is in a place that's confined or where there's, there, there's large trees or wilderness. But a pasture, when you're out in the middle of a pasture, there's safety, there's security in that. The, the, Jesus said, when you come to me, you'll go in and out and you'll find the pasture land. You'll find the place of refreshing. You'll find the place of sustenance. You'll find the place of security and safety and provision when you come to me. Why? Because the shepherd cares for them. Verse 11 through 13 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And then he goes on to explain about a hired hand. You know, when a hired hand is, is, if I'm a hired hand, if I'm not the shepherd, if those aren't my sheep, and I'm laid at the door of the sheep pen, or I'm out in the, past, in the, in the wilderness with them, and a, and a wolf comes along, ain't my sheep. I'm out. That's what happens, right? That's what Jesus said. A hired hand, someone, who, someone who's not invested in the life of the sheep, someone who is not theirs, there, there's no loss there. Guess what? A hired hand, when, when danger comes, they'll turn and run. They'll turn and go away. That's how you know they're a thief. That's how you know they're not, not necessarily a thief, but that's how you know they're, they're not, it's not their sheep. But what happens, what does the shepherd do? The shepherd puts himself in between. The shepherd will willingly lay down his life because the shepherd cares. Do you realize that your shepherd, Jesus, cares for you? He's already given up his life so that you and I could have life. The good shepherd offers security, he offers shelter, and finally he offers salvation. Verses 14 through 21 go through this same kind of scenario. He says in verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Even as the Father knows me, I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Again, over and over and over again, he talks about laying down his life for the sheep. The shepherd trusts the sheep. The sheep trust the shepherd. You know why the sheep trust the shepherd? Because the shepherd, David talks about in Psalm 23 again, he talks about the rod and the staff. You know, I told you earlier the sheep are prone to wander. They're prone to wander off. They'd, they'd go over and fall in a pit. And they'd wander off from the flock. There's the safety in the herd. They would wander off from the flock and, and, um, and be, could be attacked by wild animals or, or fall into the, the various hardships. And, and many times the the shepherd, he had, a, he had a rod and a staff. And the staff, you know, one end of it, you've seen a shepherd's crook, it has a, a hook on it. And that hook was to kind of reach out sometimes and grab the sheep and pull them back in if they're starting to wander off. But if you had a sheep that would continually wander off, and I always thought this was kind of cruel when I first realized it until I read the, read the whole story of it. But the rod was used for when a sheep would continually wander off and get itself in trouble, continue to get away from the herd, continue to, that one that just kept going, that kept going, kept going. The rod was used many times to break that sheep's leg. Now I thought, wow, that's kind of cruel. That's kind of mean, isn't it? You know, this, we'll, we'll call Peter and you turn him in. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that's, but that's not what he was doing. You see, what happened when the shepherd broke the sheep's leg, what had to happen then was the shepherd had to take the sheep, repair the broken leg, and then put the sheep on his shoulders and carry that sheep until it was well. Because what that taught that sheep was, he didn't break my leg to hurt me. He broke that leg to help me. Because in my own and left to myself, guess what I do? I wander off. And you know, see, in, in our world, we, we can't always see the danger. For a sheep, for a shepherd anyway, for the sheep, he could see the dangers. He knew that getting too far away was dangerous. We don't always realize that, do we? We think, oh, I can handle it. I'm strong. I don't need the church. I don't need to show up. I don't need to, I don't need other Christian friends around me to be accountability partners. I don't need other people to call me out when I, I I'm, I'm strong enough to do it on my own. 
If we have that attitude, it won't be long until we'll be far away from where God wants us to be. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. We're made to be, that's why the sheep illustration is so perfect. We're made to be part of the herd. We're made to be led by the shepherd, and we're made to be in relationship with other people. Why? Because we need them. We need them to speak truth into our lives. We need them to join us. The shepherd joins the sheep. You know, he talks about that, that he, he goes in, he, he talks about, I have other sheep. Jesus said in verse 16, in, in this particular uh, context, he's talking about maybe Gentiles. He's talking to Hebrew Jews at this time. He says, there's other sheep out there that I still got to bring into this fold. And we're, we're going to get them. I'm going to bring them in. Why? So that we all can be one flock. There are many other denominations out there. You know, sometimes we get at odds with one or the other, but and I don't mean other faiths. I don't even mean other religions. I mean people who believe in Jesus Christ, that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And you know, we're called to be one flock. We're called to be one church, one body of believers. Yes, some may, we may do things a little differently, but that's okay. As long as we know that Jesus is the way, as long as we know that Jesus is the truth, we can come together and have fellowship. And Jesus says he's bringing those together, and he's making one flock. And he said, the, and, and, and what he's going to do, and what he's already done for us, what we look back to, what he was looking forward to, he was letting the disciples know and letting those others around know that I'm about to lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17 says, for this reason, or for the, for the love that I have for the Father and the Father has for me, I lay down my life so that I will take it again. I, one of my favorite verses in all the Scripture is, is John 10, 18. It says, no one has taken it away from me, but I lay it down on my own initiative. I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up again. This commandment I received from my Father. I want to just paraphrase that as we wrap this up. What does that mean? That means when I think about Easter, when I watch the movie, The Passion of the Christ, maybe you've seen it, maybe you watch it every Easter to kind of remind you of of what Easter really all is about and kind of maybe a little bit of what Jesus went through. Or maybe you go to a, a church has a, a setting or you watch the Jesus film movie or you watch something that just reminds you of is a, a visible representation of what Jesus endured on the cross. Jesus said, you know, we a lot of times give the Romans credit for, for killing Jesus, for crucifying him. Do you realize they just did what they were told to do? Jesus said right there, nobody took my life from me. Now, think about it. How in the world is somebody going to take Jesus? Here's the guy who, who just a short time before, um, he told the winds and the seas to hush, and they did. <laughs> he was in the garden, in the, in the, in the, in the graveyard, and, and said, Lazarus. And he had to say Lazarus, because if Jesus had just said, come forth, everybody would have got up. He had to be specific. Here's a guy who spoke to the dead and they raised, who spoke to blind eyes and they saw, who touched ears and they heard, deaf ears and they heard, mute tongues and they talked, lame legs and they walked. And you mean to tell me that a few Roman soldiers are going to take his life? Not without him letting them. Not without him saying, hey, I willingly lay it down. But not only that, he said, the last part of that says, I had the authority to lay it down but I also have the authority to take it up again. And three days later, what we're celebrating just a little over a month, what we celebrate every day in our walk with Christ is a resurrected Lord who didn't have to give his life, but chose to. And you know why he chose to? Because he loves you and because he loves me. And because he loves this entire world. And he said, there's no possible way that these people that I created, because of their sinful desires or sinful flesh, their sinful, their sinful nature, there's no way they'll ever get to eternal life. There's no way they'll ever make it unless I take their place. Isaiah 53 is the first place where we read about the substitutionary atonement of Christ. And I know that's a big $3 phrase that I learned in seminary. Do you know what that means? Christ just took my place. What I deserved, he took. 
when I should have been the one laying there on the cross, he told me to get up, and he laid down for me. He willingly laid it down. One of my favorite scenes, if you've ever watched the movie The Passion of the Christ, I don't know if it was, in, it had to be intentional, but it was, it was phenomenal. I never will forget when they laid him down on the cross and getting ready to drive the nails in his hands, the image that I saw is that it got ready to, and I know we will never, I just can see Jesus. I don't, I don't, I don't see him wallowing and screaming and crying out. You know what I see him doing when he, when he lay him down, they put that spike over on his wrist. I see him looking right at it. And I see him as they drive it through thinking about me thinking about you giving up his life so we didn't have to that's how much the shepherd loves his sheep he doesn't just get in the way of the wild animal he just doesn't just take care of the wild animal if need be he allows the wild animal to maul him so that the sheep can live What greater love could there ever be than that? That God so loved you and I that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him, put their faith, their trust, their hope in him, would not perish but have eternal life. That eternal life is waiting for you and for me. All we have to do is call on him. The Bible says whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will you call on him today? Have you already called on him? If you're a part of the sheepfold already, are you wandering off? Or are you listening for the master's voice? And when the shepherd's voice calls, do you follow? Because he's leading. Are you doing your own thing? Today, the Lord calls us back to him. If you've never known him, he calls you to him. If you do know him, and you've wandered off, he's calling you back to him. We serve a God who is long-suffering toward us. He doesn't want anybody to perish. He wants everybody to come to repentance. The question is, will you receive that call?